Hey everyone, this is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. I'm standing by with Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. We're going to host a live play-by-play -play in just a few minutes. So hang out with us. Uh, tons of bears at the waterfall today. We'll take a look at other parts of the river too. And I think we're going to have a good time. So thanks for being here. We'll start the broadcast at the top of the hour in just a few minutes. Hey everyone, Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Please stand by and hang out with us. Starting at the top of the hour, Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park and myself will host a live play-by-play -play broadcast to talk about the bears and salmon that we're seeing live at Brooks Falls in Katmai National Park, Alaska. Looks like it's uh, going to be a great evening or afternoon or morning, no matter where you happen to be around the world, to do some bear watching. We're glad you're here. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Hi everyone, welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. I'm the resident naturalist with Explore.org. I'm also a former park ranger at Katmai National Park. And during today's play-by-play -play broadcast, my co-host is Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. Naomi, great to speak with you. Glad you're here again. A lot of bears at the falls today. Oh, yeah, it's great to be here. It's been quite a couple of weeks or three weeks here at the falls. Um, so many interesting activities to talk about. Play-by-play broadcast. My co-host is Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. Naomi, great to speak with you. Glad you're here again. A lot of bears. And we will uh, be talking, of course, about the bears, the salmon that will... Uh, the activity at the river itself. If you hear pauses from time to time, that's basically just Naomi and I maybe gathering our thoughts, thinking about what we're going to do uh, next. So I'll be uh, the producer for the broadcast as well as a commentator. Um, and Naomi is going to be adding her insights as well. If you're not familiar with this location, though, let's head up 
uh, to a larger view. We'll find out where Katmai National Park is. It's about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska, and Brooks Falls bisects Brooks River. Brooks River is about a mile and a half long. And along with the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams along Brooks River. The signal from those webcams is sent wirelessly to the top of Dumpling Mountain, hopped up and over using two radio repeaters there. And then that signal from Dumpling Mountain is sent to uh, the small town of King Salmon, where it is uploaded to the internet eventually, where it can uh, be streamed anywhere where you have an internet connection. So it's a remote location. Keeping the cameras up and running can be a challenging task, um, but we're grateful for the opportunity to share this place with everyone. If you have questions about bears, salmon, Katmai National Park, you can uh, ask your question in advance. You can find a link for that at the bottom of the, the screen below the live camera feed itself. And I have a few of those questions queued up here. We'll try to incorporate those into the broadcast a little bit later on. We'll uh, be toggling through several different um, webcams today. Of course, we have the Brooks Falls camera. Um, that's going to be the focus of most of our attention because there's just a ton of bears there. We'll also be going downstream towards the mouth of Brooks River, um, depending on what activity is like there. And that's about uh, three quarters of a mile downstream as the water flows. And then we'll be heading closer to the falls, also to the riffles. This area is just about 100 yards uh, downstream. However, Naomi, uh, let's head back up to the waterfall. You know, you've uh, been at the river all summer checking things out, and we're seeing just as many bears, you know, at the river now, it seems like, as we were uh, when I was there back, let's say, the middle of July. So, like, around July 10 or so, uh, July 13, we were seeing a ton of bears around the falls. A lot of the bears, they tend to disperse away from the river. Uh, by the end of July, but it seems like there's enough salmon to keep the bears around. Yeah, I, I mean, again, um, huge numbers of bears uh, that we're not used to seeing at this time of year. And I think it's it's interesting because it's just enough salmon where they a big pulse will come through and they'll get full and you'll see all the scraps around and then there's no salmon for a day or so, and then we see all these bears. It's um, it's great bear watching. Oops. And this this yeah, this wide angle view here really gives us a great perspective on how many bears can try to pack themselves into the waterfall at a single point in time, and how they're really kind of partitioning themselves into different fishing spots. You know, we have some of the big adult males at the base of the falls, right up against the waterfall itself. Uh, a couple of adult females with uh, offspring on the top of the waterfall, and then a bunch of other bears hovering uh, below the waterfall, too. Yeah, and family groups. Um, it's it's interesting to see how many family groups are um, at the falls now and have been at the falls, um, uh, females with springers. Um, but right now we're seeing uh, a couple of really interesting family groups, sows with uh, yearlings at the top of the falls. Yeah, if you're not familiar with those bears on the top of the waterfall, uh, there's a mother bear with two yearlings there, uh, number 128. She is nicknamed Grazer. The, uh, there's also a mother bear up there with one yearling. It's, it can be, get a little confusing. They sometimes end up getting mixed up. Uh, they seem to have developed a tolerance for one another up there. But the other mother with a single yearling, that is number uh, 806. And then I think, uh, Naomi, as well, uh, below the waterfall, kind of on the outside of the jacuzzi, there's a, um, some bears hanging around there. We've seen Divot up here uh, today with her, um, her two cubs. We also, about an hour ago, saw a mother with two, um, or excuse me, with three spring cubs. So I think there's an opportunity really to see uh, many bear families at the waterfall, which isn't um, unprecedented, but it seems to be, uh, it's, it's a little uncommon. We don't see every mother bear coming to visit Brooks Falls. I think what, what makes this a little unusual is um, it's in July 
and it's when the big dominant boars are still around. Um, not not all um, sows will bring their cubs to the falls. Um, one notable uh, exception is uh, 435 Holly, who really has not come to the falls this year. Um, and she will f fish the falls when she doesn't have cubs. Mike, do you know if she has traditionally brought cubs to the falls in previous years? Sometimes. When she has older cubs, like yearlings, uh, she'll, she'll visit the falls occasionally. But I think, you know, maybe she's able to make a living elsewhere. And that's perhaps why we're not seeing her up at the waterfall uh, right now. But with spring cubs, yeah, she's one of those bears that just avoids the falls altogether. Now, Grays are on the top of the waterfall. She's a bit more bold. She'll come to the waterfall with her cubs, um, even when they're, when they're spring cubs. Uh, so they get uh, quite the education at uh, trying to navigate around these other bears. Yeah, and they're looking pretty, those cubs are looking pretty comfortable up there right now. Um, even, you know, trying their own hands at, at fishing. And they've gotten really and I, big. I, I definitely do think uh, as well that uh, the kind of the trio of bears at bottom left, we can only see two of them right now. I think that is Divot and her cubs as well. So a lot of, a lot of mother bears uh, in the vicinity right now and a great look from our camera operators at the bears on the lip of Brooks Falls. You can maybe see some differences in personalities and disposition here, Naomi. If we see, uh, you know, another bear approach Grazer and her family, we're likely to see Grazer act really defensive. And again, she's the, the mother bear that's closest to us. Her yearling, she has one of her yearlings right on the edge of the waterfall. Grazer is standing just behind uh, that yearling. And then that other bear on the, just on the opposite side of Grazer is 806. Um, and her yearling is standing behind her. So we might see 806 kind of avoid the approach of, of other bears, but Grazer, she is uh, not shy about just getting right up in their face. <laughs> that, that's very true. Um, and what's also interesting is that look how far her second cub has strayed, all, um, almost edging off the screen to the left. Um, and it, it just shows if you wa have watched their development over the last couple of weeks, those cubs were sticking very close and now they're meandering off a little bit more. Now 806 has caught a fish. She often likes to move away from the lip of the waterfall with her salmon and eat it closer to those rocks. Maybe it's just a bit of a more secure place for her to do that. You know, when you're standing on the edge of the waterfall, uh, it's it's only one one small step towards the bottom of the waterfall. So some bears will move away to, to eat their catch. It help, also helps them keep a better uh, eye on things and make sure that they're not approached or surprised um, by other bears. Uh, of course, uh, Naomi, and, and maybe this I can get to this question now at the beginning of our, our broadcast here. You know, so we talked a little bit about it earlier, but Jennifer was wondering, and she submitted this question in advance through the Ask Your Bear Cam question form. Why are sows with cubs risking coming to the falls? And, you know, it is a big risk for them to be around these other bears, but the reward can be great. Yeah, and uh, here we have an example of the kind of risk that a sow like uh, 128 is taking because in the jacuzzi below her is, uh, I believe, Bear 856. Is that correct? Yeah, Mike? I think so. Mm -hmm. And um, he is a very dominant bear. He, he's not, doesn't seem as dominant as, as he has been in previous years, uh, but um, he will, you know, he can still enter the falls area and bears will move away. Um, but Grazer is pretty fearless when she has to be, and um, she stood up to 856 before. So being up there on the lip with 856 below is not without its risk. And yeah, let's uh, take a look here at 856, just give you a better view. This is a photo of him from earlier this July. So sort of triangle-shaped ears in a, in a sense, uh, lighter blonde ears compared to the rest of his fur. Um, he hasn't really shed so much of his fur like we've seen in years past. And he doesn't, he, so he's not really showing a lot of prominent wounds and scars around his face and neck, but he often has a lot of those as well. And then we'll take a better look here at um, number 
uh, one two eight grazer to give you a better idea of what she looks like if you're not familiar with her very blonde ears even in the fall um, as her the rest of her body uh, fur kind of darkens as she grows in that new fur coat her ears still tend to be uh, very very blonde so uh, she's a very uh, prominent feature epix falls this year has been so for the last several weeks and if you're watching bear cam at all uh, recently you've probably had a great opportunity to watch uh, 128 do her thing she's one of the more defensive mother bears uh, at the river and it's really fascinating to see how each one of these mother bears do try to make a living because they don't all do it uh, in in the same way um, you know grazers really really bold on top of the uh, waterfall 806 kind of has a more of a i guess more of a moderate approach she'll be defensive when she has to but she often you know tries to avoid those conflicts but grazer really does have a reputation among other bears and some of the even big adult males like like 151 walker he'll he won't really approach grazer's vicinity um he's been uh, beaten up by her enough times that he just says you know what i'm just gonna give her her space um and we don't often see that with um a, like a female bear you know exerting that level of dominance over uh, over an adult male and as as we see um the 806 has gotten another uh fish it's interesting to watch the behavior between, for me to watch the behavior between these two family groups. I mean, look at Grazer's cubs heading over there towards 806 and her cub. Um, and Grazer has kind of come to an accommodation with 806 and even 806's cub, allowing that cub to approach her cubs. And she doesn't do that a lot. Now, I view 806's cub as a very, social bear but um what's going on there right now mike another well it looks bear? like another bear came into the vicinity yeah to try to get some of that fish that 806 and her yearling were were eating and of course that was just a little bit too close to grazer so grazer came over and decided to back that other bear away and that's just a classic example of her behavior uh, other mother bears might just kind of ignore that situation and say hey you stay away from my yearlings then i will uh you know, leave you alone. But even though, you know, that, that other bear wasn't threatening uh, her yearlings at all, it was really just kind of looking for that fish. She didn't want to take any chances. So she got right up in that other bear's face and backed it away. And I think 806, in a sense, since Grazer and 806 have come to a bit of a truce, uh, is maybe benefiting a little bit from that defensiveness. And this is, like you were talking about before, just a great example of how, uh, you know, bears can learn to tolerate one another. And the on the lip of the waterfall, there are actually more fishing spots available for bears now than there were at the beginning of July, just because we've, we're seeing bears becoming more tolerant of one another. And now, uh, now it looks like, uh, like divots, uh, one of divots yearlings is trying to get close to, to Grazer and her family. Uh, so a bunch of yeah. bear families right now, all interacting, you know, it, it really does demonstrate that maybe the hunger that they're, they're experiencing right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think we should keep watching uh, Divot's cub there because um, Grazer may or may not tolerate that. Um, she seems to be a little more forgiving with with cubs than she is with with sub adults or or adult bears. But um, something to watch over there, and also to watch what Divot does about that. Yeah, Divot you know, maybe a little bit hesitant to climb that waterfall. She may recognize Grazer. She may recognize uh, that bear's defensiveness and not want to get in her way. Mother bears, more than other classes of bears, I guess you should you could say, tend to show a tolerance for one another. They, they seem to, many times they seem to recognize they're they're kind of like in the same fight. You know, they're, they're protecting their own offspring, of course, and they're not helping out the offspring of other other bears, but they were like, oh yeah, I see that you have a little one with you. All right. Yeah. You're probably, you know, angry at me because I'm too close to your offspring and vice versa. Um, so we, we sometimes do see that with, with, with mother bears, even, even grazer. Uh, but divot. Yeah. She, sometimes we'll see her visit the lip of the waterfall. Not all the time though. It seems like she hovers more on the fringes and try to fish and tries to fish successfully downstream. So she might be feeling more hunger pangs than the mother bears on the lip of the falls. 
Yeah, Grazer has just been up there nonstop and successfully fishing, but um, but it's just not enough. I mean, sometimes we get questions about, well, um, can a bear eat too much? And, um, I, you know, I don't think so. And, and Mike, how much do you think they they can at this time of year they can just say okay i'm full that's enough i'm gonna go away i think so yeah i think at this time of the year they're still feeling like that um like a maybe a normal le le um, level of, of satiation uh, they will feel full they'll go into the forest they'll rest it um you know and the rest they'll digest those uh those those calories but later in the year as they progress closer and closer towards their hibernation period um you know that that feeling of fullness within the bear after a big meal switches off and they just want to eat and eat and eat and of course eventually they have to stop and take a rest but um th that's a process called hyperphagia and the bears aren't aren't there yet even though they they can eat dozens of salmon uh, per day and over the over the course of summer many of these bears are going to eat thousands of pounds of salmon uh, before they go into hibernation, especially the big males uh, that are focused more or less on eating salmon and, and pr practically nothing else at this time of the year. They, they can eat uh, sometimes uh, two, three, uh, even four tons, uh, standard tons of salmon, uh, no joke. So, I mean, they are eating a tremendous uh, amount of fish. 856 in the jacuzzi right now, Naomi, interestingly enough, doesn't look like he's finding the same level of success that 806 and Grazer are finding on the lip of the waterfall. It seems like we've seen those females catching more salmon than, than 856, and he's a master angler in the jacuzzi. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and and um, f further... Um, uh, we see Popeye 634 down there below the falls and another large male and um, he's not catching very many fish either. It seems to be the time for the, uh, the ladies of the lip. And often when there are a few fish at Brooks Falls or there are many salmon still swirling in that plunge pool below the lip where we're seeing the family groups standing right now, so I think A56 has a really good shot at being successful in that location. He just hasn't uh, had that opportunity uh, yet. Or maybe he's just full from meals earlier in the day and he doesn't want to work that hard. We'll sometimes see the bears in all positions at the waterfall become more selective in not only the parts of the fish that they want to eat uh, as, they, as they catch more and more salmon, uh, but also in the level of work that they want to put into it. You know, when they're really hungry, they they they'll, they'll chase fish through the water. When they're not, when they're not so hungry, uh, when they're close to be to being you know packed full of salmon as much as they can, then they're they they'd rather do no work at all and and only catch fish unless a salmon bumps uh, into them. Popeye though, right, <laughs> kind of in the middle of the waterfall, center of. Um, almost at a top center there standing up. There's a rock there that he waits for salmon to kind of uh, jump on top of almost. Uh, they can't see him very well in that spot, I suspect. Um, so he's waiting for salmon to make mistake. The bear's in the far side, same thing. They're waiting for uh, salmon to swim sort of right in front of them uh, so they can pounce on those fish and happen to be vulnerable. And the topography of the waterfalls is really kind of what makes this phenomenon uh, possible without the waterfall, without the vulnerability of of salmon at this spot, then we would we would really see very few bears uh, fishing the river overall. And and back, um, it's um, a little hard to see, but almost up against the wall on the far side is um, number thirty two chunk, who has a, a large um, injury uh, on his nose a large, uh, soon to be scar. And he's been staying over there or being a little down river, resting in the cool water and then standing um, um, a little closer is bear 503. who's the very large bear there 
um, near what we call the conveyor belt. And there's another bear who came down from above the falls. And I, I can't quite make out what bear that is. Yeah, our um, wonderful camera operator will um, be moving to the far pool here in just a little bit, just sent her a message. So thanks to all of our camera operators for explore.org. They really help to give you um, these great bear viewing opportunities. Before we uh, jump to the far pool here, um, let's take a look at the riffles. This is about 100 yards downstream. We were talking earlier about adult males that maybe won't approach uh, one to a grazer. And I think you know, that one bear that I was mentioning is in. Uh, the riffles right now, uh, number 151 Walker. He is uh, a big guy, um, over a thousand pounds in the fall. But yeah, he is uh, in, a, in a sense subordinate to uh, number 128 um, Grazer. And Naomi, he likes to fish that sort of jacuzzi spot in in the riffles. Yeah, it's a, um, he doesn't have to, he's a big, he gets to be a big bear and he's been a little more aggressive this year, um, throwing his weight around. Um, but um, uh, now one of the cam viewers um, asked me if I saw 151 since he was in an altercation with, I believe, 747. Um, and I have seen him um, uh, pretty consistently in the riffles. Um, which has been a strategy for him for the last couple of years where uh, he can successfully fish in that mini jacuzzi and get fat and not really have to compete with the likes of uh, 128 Grazer or um, 856 or 747. So no, no dumb bear. It's a great example of how bears are adaptable and they can change their behavior depending on the circumstance. So 151 in upper right there, just sitting, waiting for salmon to come to him. Looks like a couple of other um, bears moving into the water below him, searching for salmon. So we'll see, of course, the bears that are uh, not as well fed, taking a more active approach and uh, seeking salmon in, in different locations, scavenging fish, but also searching shallow areas where maybe they've discovered uh, salmon before let's head back up to the waterfall right now and uh great look at uh, the trio of bears in the far pool naomi you were mentioning chunk on the far side there you can see him with a really prominent scar or wound across his muzzle and then uh 503 standing on the right side of the screen and maybe it's really hard to tell because this bear is facing away from us so until it turns and get a uh, i get a look at its face i'm not quite sure this could be could be a female standing there. Could be number thirty-nine. Uh, not, not hundred percent sure of that. Or perhaps two seven three. I, I don't know. I'm seeing a beard. Yes, there, that'd be but... another another good, um, another good guess at this point in time. Uh, but you know these bears are not separated by a huge distance. Just a, kind of a few yards in between them. The the telescopic view of the camera kind of smooshes them together. It makes them look closer than they actually are. Chunk, he, loved, he loves to fish the jacuzzi, but he this year, even though he's really a big guy, he is still, uh, or he still deferred, defers and yields to the really big adult males that we see at the falls, like 856 and 747. So we'll see him not try to provoke a confrontation with them and try to move away as best he as best he can and 503 Naomi we've been seeing him showing some more assertiveness uh, this year but he still defers to those other bears more often than not and he also I mean it's interesting if you look at him now and and if any of you have been watching him over um, the past few weeks he's he's actually gotten fatter and he's a bear where it's hard to see how fat he is because he's so tall and, and big, and he does play a lot. I always say about 503, if you would eat more and play less, he'd be gargantuan. Um, the other day we saw him playing with bear eight, nine backpacks. So he, although he's gotten a little more aggressive, he is still a very social bear. Yeah, he's a very, um, a very interesting bear to watch, has a really great uh, life story. He was uh, separated from his mother 
as a yearling. He was adopted by number 435 Holly, spent another couple summers with her. Now he's growing rapidly into this large, successful bear. And he's not done growing yet. He still has a lot of body mass that he can gain. He may even grow a little bit taller and a little bit longer, but he's kind of approaching that point in his life where he's going to start slowing down the uh, his growth rate as far as length and height goes. But he'll, um, he'll become... Um, he'll still be able to gain a lot of body mass. But patience pays off, Naomi. We saw that, that bear standing a little bit closer to, um, to our camera, uh, just catch a fish here successfully and eating it in a spot where it uh, maybe doesn't have to deal with as much water. Yeah. I mean, and that's something we, we see all the time with bears. They take them to a spot where they can hold on to it better in this current or maybe um, hold on to it and not have other bears come and, uh, and procure that fish from them. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but I don't like to eat food with water squirting out my nose. And maybe bears uh, don't enjoy <laughs> that uh, sensation either. Um, we'll, we'll see a lot of bears move to that little um, lee spot on the downstream side of, of that boulder where there's just not as, as much water flowing. And, uh, so they, they again, they, they don't want to work any harder than they have to. And they're certainly going to take advantage of the opportunities that the waterfall provides for them. Let's uh, take a, maybe for a moment here, let's take a closer look at um, number 32, uh, Chunk. So he's in the far side of the waterfall right now, really prominent muzzle scar we were talking about earlier. Uh, but we don't know um, how he got that scar here. Let me bring up a photo to give you a better, um, better look at what that, that uh, wound on his muzzle looked like just a few weeks ago. This was taken on July 11th. So really prominent scar and wound that'll be there through this fall. It'll probably be there next year and the year after. So if you're just trying to learn to identify some of the bears at Brooks River, Chunk is a great one to start with um, because he has that very prominent uh, wound on his muzzle. So look uh, for that overall. And Naomi, this is another question that I have um, ready here. Uh, somebody was wondering about the wounds that we see on some of these bears. And how to and, and wondering how do bears keep insects out of those deep wounds? Um, you know, I you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but in the water, they're not gonna have a lot of insects bothering them. Um and um they they there seems to be something about their um physiology where they're um they their wounds don't get infected in the same way that ours do? Perhaps you can answer that insect question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know as well. I, I was, I was kind of hoping I'd throw that out there and maybe you'd, uh, you'd uh, have, you know, uh, have an answer. Um, so I could, so I could, I could say, Oh yeah, that is, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Cause I, I don't know. Uh, insects don't truth, like, but yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> we can make something up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, being in the water, that's, um, that probably helps them in a sense, uh, but they don't like get gangrene uh, like, like a person would. If we were rolling around in the dirt, for instance, um, eating a lot of raw fish, um, they don't, and they don't groom themselves either. They, uh, you know, they're not like a cat uh, where they're going to be like licking their wounds or licking their fur. So it's, it's quite remarkable how they're able to uh, stay healthy despite having, you know, um, these injuries and wounds. And maybe since they are injured so frequently in life, that's just something that they've evolved over time, an adaptation that allows um, them uh, to do that. Uh, so Chunk on the far side there with that prominent muzzle wound, just got a glimpse of maybe Divot. It looked like she moved uh, uh, to the far side of the lip of the waterfall with her three cubs. Um, so Mike, I have, um, it's a great view of Chunk and that um, I think female bear there. Thank you, Cam Ops, you're the best. Um, so um, a question about the area above the falls, right around there. Um, we've seen a number of bears uh, trying to fish from there and that doesn't seem to me a protect, particularly um, fruitful spot to fish what do you think about that mike no it 
it doesn't seem to be not because I don't think a lot of salmon actually successfully jump the waterfall in that location. Uh, and we'll just cut to a scene of that area here uh, just quickly. Um, so that's the, the far side of Brooks Falls uh, taken in late May of 2015. And we don't see a lot of bears fishing there, I think, just because not a lot of salmon jump successfully in that location. So that's maybe um, perhaps the reason um, why. Let's uh, head down to the riffles, though, uh, Naomi, because it's a oh. mother bear and a spring cub, which we haven't had an opportunity to talk about yet during this broadcast. Maybe this is number 909. Uh, and her single spring cub. I've really had very few opportunities to see her this year. I'm glad she's uh, coming to view during the broadcast, looking for some salmon. Yeah, and she has those very distinctive ears, much like her sister, uh, Bear 910. And and look at the cub. It's so interesting um, because that cub is not used to being up there in the riffles. Um, I think maybe a little nervous about the other bears around it, nervous about the current, and 909 doesn't seem very calm either. No, she's certainly paying attention to the proximity of other bears. And when you see a cub right on the haunches of mom or right next to mom, that can indicate a little bit of nervousness going on. Uh, some yawning going on there from 909. Yawning is a sign of stress in bears frequently. So, that also suggests to me that she's a little bit nervous with the situation. And she's got, she's also got two big adult males uh, nearby. She's got some bears running on the far side, not a lot of margin for error for her. Uh, but you know, her hunger is bringing her to this location. And she's one of those bears that certainly has shifted her behavior this year compared to years past. Last year, we would see her fishing on the lip of the falls frequently and the year before that. But since she had this cub, and this is her first litter uh, that we know of, she's just decided, hey, it's it's safer. It may be harder for me to find food, but it's certainly safer for me to avoid the lip of the falls. Yeah, she was very slow last year on the lip of the falls. And um, her uh, mother was Bear 409 Beadnose, who is um, really the iconic bear that we think of when we think about um, fishing on the lip. And um, 909 got really hefty last year doing that, but um, not this year. I saw her in camp last night with that cub, very close. So 909, moving out of our frame, very prominent, large blonde ears. If you get a look at her, she has one single cub of the year. So that cub was born last winter. Right now, it's uh, probably six months old, so it's a, it's a young cub, uh, and it'll be fascinating to see the progression of this family, the growth over the course of the year. And then next year, hopefully if 909 comes back with that cub, to see how it grows in independence, kind of like what we've been seeing with uh, 128 and 806's uh, yearlings on the top of the falls. We see them acting more uh, independent, um, certainly in comparison to 909 here. And just the size difference too, Naomi, I mean, um, that, that cub is not small. I think if we were next to it and we picked it up, it may weigh 30, 40 pounds or something close to that. But um, it, it, it looks small compared to the rest of the bears. Yeah, um, but she's going away, you know. But there – I mean, we see a lot of um, family groups and especially sows with spring cubs down there in the riffles. And we've been seeing uh, sows – uh, tree their cubs down there, which um, means that they um, they prompt their their cubs to go climb climb the trees and stay there while while they fish, and so the cubs are safer and the moms can uh, make a living. So there are refuges for bears, different parts of the river. Again, it's it's. They're constantly weighing risk versus reward. When they go to the waterfall, the risk is being close to a lot of other bears and in competing for fishing spots. The reward is can be very great with food. But we're now downstream, Naomi, we're seeing a bear practicing a different fishing style. Not a lot of competition for space down here, but it's harder to find food. However, maybe if it's uh, if 
you know, if, if you're not feeling as bold as some of the other bears, then at this time of the year, this uh, lower river area, just north of the bridge can be a great place uh, to fish. Yeah, it's, it's pretty deep right now. So that's pretty tough going for those bears. It's hard, it, it's easy salmon to move out of the way. Um, even um, when we had all those salmon coming uh, a week ago uh, and there were um, a lot of bears who were full and they were high grading and there were lots of salmon parts floating downstream, hard for the bears to get those because the water level is so high. Few bears will dive for salmon, which is kind of interesting. We'll see some bears doing it, but a lot of them either don't learn how to do it or don't prefer to do it. And you can see this bear practicing what we like to call snorkeling. Uh, this is something that's really universally practiced by bears uh, it, that visit Brooks River. They'll stick their faces in the water, but they'll keep their ears out of the water. seems like they don't like to get their ears wet for whatever reason. We're not sure why, uh, but they'll just look for anything that can't swim away. And with deep water in the lower area of, of Brooks River, again, about three quarters of a mile downstream, of the waterfall it's just it's just a tough spot for bears to catch fish right now it'll become a more successful fishing location as salmon begin to spawn and die in greater numbers coming up in in late august and september but we haven't really reached that point yet so, so bears might be able to find a few dead salmon near uh, this area but it's it's not the most productive uh, fishing spot and I think that's why let's head back up to the falls, Naomi. That's certainly why we're seeing a lot more bears uh, taking their chances at Brooks Falls compared to uh, the lower river area. I mean, you talk about a lot about bears being um, opportunistic, and this is part of it. They're they're smart. They're flexible. Um, they know most of the bears here know this area, and if there's not good fishing in one area, they'll they'll try another. Great view here of 128 Grazer and her yearlings eating uh, salmon. And we're more than halfway through our broadcast for today. So if you're just tuning in, thanks for joining us. My name is Mike Pitts with Explore.org. My co-host for this play-by-play -play on July 26, 2021 is Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. And Naomi, we just looked at 909's uh, spring cub. We saw how much smaller and darker it was compared to mother. And these are fairly sizable bears here, these two yearlings. I mean, they could be 150 pounds, maybe even approaching 200 pounds. They are big and, and they are getting fat. Um, Grazer's done really well by them and they're starting to do well by themselves. They're, they're starting to uh, fish on their own. They're also con continuously demanding of mom stealing her fish from her when they can but their mom is grazer. She's not necessarily going to give up that fish when she doesn't want to. That has also been something interesting to watch with this family is how uh, grazer won't share her fish necessarily with her cubs. She will catch fish and she will start to eat that fish. And she's tolerant of her yearlings taking fish away from her, but she's not necessarily catching the fish and then laying it in a spot or handing it off to them necessarily. The cubs are really kind of competing with one another, with mother for, for those uh, salmon. We aren't seeing them like yelling at one another though, or clawing at one another right now. So that indicates that they are quite well fed. And you can actually see that they're starting to develop a bit of a tummy on them, which is a great sign of health on a brown bear at this time of the year. So Grazer is doing a, a great job at feeding uh, these cubs. And you can see that one of those yearlings moving away, looking to get uh, more salmon. Yeah. Um, not going to let any opportunity go by. And I didn't get a great look at that bear. I don't think that it was a uh, mother. However, I think no, I don't that think yearling so. was maybe being a little hopeful there and uh, thinking, well, maybe if I get a little closer that that bear will drop its salmon or maybe I'll catch mom's attention and uh, she'll chase it away and drop the fish. Didn't work out that way. But again, the, yeah, these uh, even these uh, yearlings are opportunistic. They're smart. They can recognize uh, situations where they might be able to take advantage uh, of the circumstances. And, and, and Mike, I'm going to give my, ex oops, I guess we know what sex that, that cub is. 
Yeah, definitely. Do you want to uh, tell us why we know that is a girl? Yes. Well, um, oh, I always get asked, how do you tell if it's a girl or a boy? And I said, well, the best way is to see how it pees. And that bear just peed straight out the back, which means it's a girl. And um, if it pees underneath, then it's a boy. So we know that that cub is a girl. And that's probably the best way to determine sex in young bears. It's really difficult to see genitalia in these young bears. So, so look for the urination pattern. Look which way they pee. That's probably going to be the easiest way for you to tell. When you're looking at uh, adult bears, you can look for other things. Like sometimes you can see the genitalia, like especially in adult males. But you can also look for adult males to have bigger heads in proportion to their body than females thicker necks, a lot of scars and wounds around their face and neck too. So those are a couple of different ways um, to, to look. And it looks like maybe Grazer, excuse me, is still hanging on the lip here. Maybe um, Divot moving off upstream. Following yeah, that's her what that yearlings. Looks. It looks like her yearlings are, are leading the charge wherever they happen to be going. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so um, I was gonna just about to say that um, I'm gonna make my pitch for watching Explore over the years because I'm really looking forward to seeing what the personalities and the behaviors of Grazer's cubs are once they're emancipated from her because they're learning so many interesting behaviors from her. Absolutely. So we can, we can hope that these two young bears will come back as independent bears and grow into adults here at Brooks River. That doesn't always happen. Often they disperse into different areas. Uh, but yeah, it'll be fascinating to see how their personalities, their dispositions, their skill levels change. They right now are, because of their proximity to mother, they are achieving a pretty high rank in the bear hierarchy because there are so few bears that Grazer will avoid uh, right now. Uh, but that's not going to be the case next year. She was likely to wean them uh, next spring, and they're going to be on their own. They're going to be experiencing life on their own for the first time. And that's, that can be a really uh, difficult transition. We, However, Naomi, we definitely see uh, bears changing their uh, dispositions and personalities over over the years. And I, let's um, take a look at the riffles just one more time at 151 Walker because he's a bear that used to be quite playful. And I think when um, you started first watching, started watching Bear Cam, he was one of the more playful young, young bears that we, that we saw. And now that's not necessarily the case. No, he, um, I mean, I, I haven't seen it on the cams because I don't get to watch the cams as much as you all do. But um, I have not seen him play this year. I have seen him make some very purposeful uh, displays of dominance, pushing bears out, even initiating uh, fights. Um, but um, he seems like he's been put in his place for a while. And finding success. So again, that's one of his preferred fishing spots at the waterfall, that sort of deeper area in the Riffles area. And that's a spot where he doesn't have to deal with a lot of competition from other adult males. So if he were to go up to uh, the falls right now and try to fish in the jacuzzi, he would he would have to tangle with 856. Or if he were to go into the far pool, he would have to deal with number 32 chunk. But down at the riffles, he kind of has that area to himself. If Grazer goes down there, he might have to tangle with her. But otherwise, yeah, this is a, a great spot for him to just be patient and, and wait for those uh, opportunities. Let's go back up to the waterfall, though, because this is just a great close-up of 856 here. Um, some scars and wounds around his uh, face and neck, uh, but he uh, is, again, one of those really skilled anglers in the jacuzzi. And this, this view here really gives us, I think, a good opportunity to see how full the water is with air. There's so much air within the water that bears can't really fish there um, by sight. They're actually doing it, doing it by feel. What have you noticed, Naomi, with, with bears like 856 in the jacuzzi? How are they making those catches? Well, they feel them underneath with their paws, and um, and then they they kind of catch them with their arms and their mouth. 
Um, and a lot of people think, oh, they're just being lazy. There he goes under to get that fish that he, he felt with his paw, and there it is. Thank you, 856, for that demonstration. Great demonstration. Yeah, just doing it by feel, waiting for a salmon to make a mistake. And, and frequently, um, if I'm interpreting at the falls, people say, or I hear people saying, oh, that bear is just sitting there and not doing anything. And that's not true. They are actively fishing. Yeah, it often looks like they're just not doing anything at all. They're probably enjoying the water <laughs> in, a, in a way, but they, they really do um, look you know, like they're not paying attention, but they certainly are. And it looks like uh, another bear moving closer to the jacuzzi. I don't know if he'll move into there. That may be uh, 801. Uh, very wide set ears on that bear. Uh, and that's my uh, best best guess there. 856 likes to move out of the jacuzzi when he eats um, his salmon most frequently. So that'll be, uh, we'll be curious to see whether um, 856 just heads straight back head straight back into the jacuzzi. If so, we'll likely see 801 kind of move to the far side of the waterfall if he can find space there. But there's some big bears that he has to compete with. Grays are on top of the waterfall right now with her two yearlings eating salmon. It looks like a, a young adult male number 821 down below the waterfall. He kind of has like a triangle shaped muzzle. Uh, he also has a scar on his right um, hip. So that's a, a couple of things that I look for when I'm trying to identify this bear. He will also fish uh, the lip of the waterfall too. So we'll sometimes see him up there. It was also interesting. He, he looked like he was thinking about trying to steal that fish from Grazer, but thought better of it. Smart bear. We did see an example of what happens when a bear doesn't, doesn't uh, learn its lesson quickly enough. Uh, last week when uh, a young bear tried to reach up and grab some fish away from Grazer and her family. She was basically in this spot. Uh, the young bear was able to reach up successfully once and grab some fish away. So it went back for a second time and it didn't work out. It was actually trying to climb the waterfall. Grazer grabbed it by the scruff of its neck and, and almost pulled it to the top of the waterfall and shook it uh, for you know, close to 25, 30 seconds or so. Um, so she really reacted violently uh, to the approach of that other bear. And we're unlikely to see that young bear attempt anything like that with, with Grazer again. So they learn from their errors. I think it's also interesting that um, 856 has allowed um, 634 Popeye to be in that spot, not too far from the jacuzzi. Um, sometimes he, he, you know, he wouldn't do that. He would clear out other bears from his location, but, um, he seems not to be doing that very much this year. And I wonder if that's because he's just not feeling as, um, you know, as strong or as, as dominant as he once was. He certainly has been very dominant even this year, but he's taken a step back from his top rank. Um, you know, he was the most dominant bear, the, con the river's most consistently dominant bear for about 10 years. And that, you know, there was a, a couple of bumps in the road for him here and there, but yeah, he really has uh, been extremely dominant for about 10 years. And this year, uh, not as dominant as, as he once was. Uh, 503 moved into the jacuzzi there just to try to take an opportunity. 801 was there for just a little bit. 801 avoided 503. Now 503 is avoiding 856. And and again, that's kind of how a lot of these interactions between bears end up playing out. It's just simple avoidance. They recognize who's more dominant and they will avoid those fights as, as best they can. Yeah. I mean... That's, you know, that's what they strive for. 856, you know, just walk in and have his fishing spot that he likes and uh, other bears walk away, except for 747 now. Popeye facing downstream in the middle of the waterfall, looking at the competition that he's facing. He's also aware of number 856 in the jacuzzi. Looks like maybe 503 is going to walk to the far pool once again and try to find space over there. But there's a bunch of bears in that location. 
looks like maybe Divot has moved down below the waterfall with her yearlings. Hard for me to see just because they're so far away right now. This jostling, however, between bears at the waterfall is really, I think, fun to watch. Uh, you get to see when you're paying attention to which bears yield space to other bears, and then you eventually can learn, you know, which fishing spots a lot of these individual bears prefer. You can really start to sort the hierarchy out uh, yourself. And I encourage you to kind of keep track of that at home, try to score, you know, uh, you know, who is the quote unquote winner in a lot of these interactions, because over time you will see the hierarchy ebb and flow. Uh, it could be a bear like, let's say, uh, 503 becoming extremely dominant in the future when um, when he has taken a back seat to a lot of, uh, you know, these larger bears for, for most of his life. Um, but 503 has a lot of growing to do. And he's over there in the far pool right now. It looks like maybe um, uh, close to uh, a family of bears there. But 503 is generally really tolerant of the close proximity of other bears. And, and another thing, as as you watch the hierarchy, um, one of the most, another frequently asked question to me here is, how do you identify the bears? And um, behavior is one of the major ways that I identify a bear. I mean, if I see a bear in the jacuzzi, I think, well, it's going to be probably 856 or 747 or 503. And then I take a look at the physical characteristics and then I go, oh, okay, that's 856. So watching the, be the, the behavior and the position in the hierarchy helps identify the bears as you watch them. So 503 right now in the far pool, right up against uh, the rock wall there tends to lick his tongue a little bit. Sometimes that can be an identifying uh, characteristic, but very tall, looks like Divot with one of her yearlings standing uh, below the waterfall, closer to the boulders. Uh, it, it, I thought her other yearling was up uh, closer to um, the top of the boulders before. Divot really kind of keeping a close eye on things over here uh, because 801 just moved into the far pool. Uh, 503 just got a little bit out of his way. <laughs> So 503 has been making uh, the rounds around the waterfall, just depending on the proximity of other bears. He could probably displace Divot from that spot if he wants to, but we don't really see 50 fishing uh, that shallow area where um, the mother bear Divot is standing right now. It seems like he'll fish kind of the deeper water, the far pool or other locations. I mean, just look at the difference in size between Divot and 503 is now going out of frame, but um, uh, Divot, I don't think of Divot as a small bear when I'm around her. No, she's certainly not. I, I mean, she could weigh some somewhere around 400 pounds at this time of the year, coming up on, you know, at the beginning of hibernation, when she's at her peak body size for the year, she could be, you know, well over 500 pounds. So she's not a small girl overall, but the average midsummer weight of adult males in Katmai at this time of the you know, so at this time of the year, seven to nine hundred pounds. And I, I'd be surprised if five oh three wasn't within that weight range right now. Maybe towards the smaller end of it, excuse me, just because he has so much uh body mass to gain and so much growing still left to do. Uh but that just shows you how how much bigger a lot of these adult males are compared to the compared to the reproducing female bears. Now, interesting observation for me is I'm looking at Divot and her cub here. And Divot does not seem like she's got a lot of fat on her. She doesn't look skinny. But then you look at her cub, and her cub is kind of getting a belly. And I think that speaks to the job of a, of a mother bear, which is um, feeding her cubs, making sure that her cubs get fat and healthy, and producing that really high fat milk for them, you know, while feed, fishing and feeding herself. It's just, I think, uh, an illustration here. Divot has done extremely well in 
caring for offspring and, and raising them to an age where they're where they're weaned. So she's had a pretty good success record um, over her time. And not all mother bears can say say the same. It's it's a difficult task, of course. You know, trying to make sure that you are gaining enough calories so not only can you survive and stay healthy, but to make sure that your cubs uh, are growing and they're learning the lessons that they need to survive uh, in the world. And Divot overcoming, uh, you know, in, uh, significant injuries in the past. If she turns her head in the right way, you can see a circular scar around her neck from a wire snare that rangers um, removed in 2014 so it's great it's always great to see her back at the river being a successful bear and um and i, I love i love watching divot come back to the river uh, each year she's well, she's one of the bears that i certainly enjoy watching uh, more than others because of that unique story and another thing um we see here is her cub kind of lifting its paw out of the water and licking at some, and that's another question I get, which I'm gonna ask you, Mike, is what about uh, the bear's tolerance for cold water? It seems like the cubs have less tolerance. Since the cubs are smaller, I, I definitely think that they get cold easier than the adult bears. You know, when you're a, when you're a big adult bear, you just have a lot of body mass. You're just a bigger object. Uh, in proportion to a smaller bear, you don't have as much surface area. So you are um, you're just a big bodied object that you and you don't cool down as easily. Maybe you're working a little bit harder too to catch uh, salmon moving around. The spring cubs certainly seem to get colder easier. They don't like to be in the water as much as um, as the adult bears. And the current's also strong for them. So it can be harder for them to navigate uh, those uh, the, the swift currents that you might find in the river. So we'll see the spring cubs more often than not kind of hang on uh, the shore. The yearlings though, they seem to tolerate it pretty well. Um, but the adult bears, certainly they're, they're very comfortable in the water. And sometimes they'll spend hours and hours and hours just sitting in the water every day uh, without getting cold. And if you or I were in the water uh, trying to replicate the same feet, we, we would become hypothermic uh, quite quickly. We're coming up on the end of our broadcast here, Naomi, just a couple of more minutes. Uh, maybe it would be a great time uh, to explain a little bit about what viewers might be able to well, expect to see at Brooks Falls over the next uh, week or two. Yeah, well, I think that, um, I mean, again, this year the, the sockeye salmon run was um, – about three weeks later than we normally see it. Um, but um, they've stopped counting. Uh Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a special thing. Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a special thing. What made this bear season so unique to you? What what was so special about it? I was I I this year there were many things. It's kind of hard to choose, honestly. Uh but this year, with the exceptional amount of salmon that returned to Brooks River, I think that really changed the dynamic on on the river. And, you know, normally bears um, into next week, we're going to start to see a lot of those bears disperse away from Brooks River to try to fish in other locations. So if you tune into the webcams in a few days and you're like, oh, well, I saw, you know, 15 bears here just a, a few days ago, and now I'm just seeing two, that wouldn't be necessarily a surprise at this time of the year. It's definitely a, a season of change for these bears and salmon are becoming more accessible for the bears throughout the watershed. 
it'll be an in interesting to watch uh, for sure. Um, it's never really the same place twice, not from not or certainly not across uh, seasons and certainly, uh, you know, not even from from day to day. It's a little bit past uh, the top of the hour, uh, and I would uh, like to thank Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park for joining me. Naomi, um, glad to have you around for your insights and, and sharing your um, expertise and experience at the river with everyone. Uh, it's it's a pleasure being here and um you know how can you get enough of these bears it's amazing absolutely so tune in to um bear cam every day through the rest of the summer because i think you'll still have plenty of great bear watching opportunities naomi and i will be uh back online with ranger leon on wednesday for a live chat about mothers and cubs so we'll go more specifically into the detailed uh, lives of those animals. Tune in to the live chat channel right here at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time for that broadcast. And then we have another play-by-play -play scheduled on Friday for 4 p.m. Eastern time. And you can find that right here on the live chat uh, channel as well. And my name is Mike Fitz with Explored.org. My co-host today, Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. Enjoy the bears and we'll talk to you soon. Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a special thing. What made this bear season so unique to you? What, what was so special about it? I was, I, I, this year there were many things. It's kind of hard to choose, honestly. Uh, but this year with the exceptional amount of salmon that returned to Brooklyn. Mike. I'm a huge bear fan and having you 